In this lecture, we'll discuss non-compliance in randomized experiments. Often, uh, for ethical and logistical reasons, we can't force uh, all the experimental units to follow the randomized uh, treatment assignment. For example, someone in the treatment group may refuse to take the treatment, while others in the control group may manage to receive the treatment. Okay, so we can't force uh, people to follow uh, the uh, treatment assignment randomized by the researcher. This is called non-compliance, and it's often a problem, but it may because it may um, induce the selection bias. One simple and effective approach in this situation is to conduct so-called intention to treat analysis or ITT analysis. The idea is that to give up estimating the effect of the treatment itself, but instead uh, estimate the effect of intention to treat and effect of the encouragement to receive the treatment which is actually randomized. So the nice thing about that is the effect of intention to treat uh, can be estimated without bias, just like you did before, uh, based on, say, simple difference in means analysis. Now, this is because the intention to treat is randomized, right? The treatment assignment is randomized, but the actual receipt, treatment receipt is not. Now, the problem, of course, is that ITT analysis doesn't address the issue problem of estimating the effect of the treatment itself, treatment receipt itself. So, for example, if the encouragement is very, very weak, and then a very uh, small number of people receive the treatment, then ITT effect may be uh, estimated to be very small, even when the treatment, if it's actually received, is very, very effective. So it's, it estimates the effect of intention to treat, to treat rather than the treatment itself. Another possibility is to conduct something called as treated analysis. Here, the idea is simple, is to compare the treated people with untreated people. But of course, this comparison is not really valid um, because people may be non-randomly selecting to receive the treatment, they may self-select themselves into receiving the treatment. Uh, if that happens, the benefit of randomization is lost and you're comparing two groups that are not very comparable. So the question uh, we're gonna discuss in this lecture is whether we can estimate the treatment effect, effect of the treatment rather than um, estimating the effect of intention to treat. Before we go into the detail, I want to emphasize that this encouragement design, where the encourage, encouragement to receive the treatment is randomized, is very effective experimental design. In fact, in many um, field experiments, it's difficult to um, randomize the receipt of the treatment itself, but often policymakers may not feel comfortable uh, randomly selecting who received the treatment. Uh, however, you could basically tell policymakers, uh, even though the researcher, I will randomize uh, who should be receiving the treatment, you don't have to, you are the policymaker, you don't have to follow that assignment. Uh, you could uh, select some of the treated units and then decide not to treat them. Or you could um, treat some of the control units instead. Or you could read the people, the, the experimental subject, decide whether uh, they should receive the treatment or not. Um, so that flexibility uh, often gives um, the credibility in terms of, uh, you know, convincing uh, policymakers to let you uh, conduct the field experiment in order to evaluate the uh, particular policy programs that you're interested in. We use the potential outcomes notation as before. We're going to use ZI. Uh, to represent the randomized encouragement. So zi is equal to one if you're encouraged and equal to zero if you're not. We're gonna have potential treatment variables because the treatment receipt, the actual receipt of the treatment may depend on the encouragement status. So we have two potential values, t of one, that's the treatment status under the encouragement, t of zero, the treatment status without encouragement, and it's also binary whether you uh, actually receive the treatment or not. 
the observed treatment receipt indicator is TI, so we only observe one of the two potential outcomes, which depends on the actual realization of the encouragement ZI. Now, the potential outcomes is a function of two things, encouragement and uh, treatment status, okay, so Z and T. So there's all, uh, four possible potential outcomes, Z and T are binary. Now, observed outcome is uh, represented by YI. Now, this is equal to whatever the encouragement status that's realized, that's ZI, and whatever the treatment status under that encouragement, um, the realized encouragement, TI of ZI. Okay. Now, we can also write this uh, potential outcome uh, as Y of Z, little z alone, not as a function of t. So the reason why you can do that is once the encouragement is determined, ti is also determined um, as a function of zi. So all we have to know is z, and that determines the potential outcome. And so that's um, notation we're going to use. Okay. We're going to assume no interference between units for both treatment and the outcome. What that means is that treatment status of unit I is only influenced by its own encouragement status, not of the somebody else encouragement status. And the same thing holds for the uh, outcome as well. Okay. Now, since the encouragement is randomized, uh, ZI is independent of all the potential values of the treatment and potential uh, outcome values as well. But the key is that the treatment receipt variable ti is not independent of potential outcomes even after conditioning on the encouragement status. Okay, because the treatment take up, treatment receipt um, may be uh, may not be random. Okay? People may self self select themselves into the treatment or control. So it's. Um, useful when we are doing this analysis um, to consider principal stratification. So this is going back to the first week of the class. So in this case, the, there are four pr principal strata based on whether or not you receive the treatment given the encouragement status. Now we're going to call somebody comprier if uh, this person takes up the treatment only when they encourage but it does not take the treatment if they are not encouraged. So t of 1 is equal to 1, t of 0 is equal to 0. So these are the people who are actually complying with your randomized treatment assignment. Now there are three types of non-compliers. There's someone called always taker who would always take the treatment regardless of the encouragement. There are never takers who never take the treatment regardless of the encouragement. And there is a defier who do the opposite of the thing that you tell them to do, which is that you, they only take the treatment when they're not encouraged. Okay? So there are four types because the treatment is binary. There are two times two. There are four types of uh, people. Um, I say this is latent type because we don't observe two potential values of the treatment at the same time for any given unit. We only give one. We only observe one of one of the two. Okay. Um, however, we can divide the population into these four types based on uh, the potential value of the treatment take up. Okay. Now let's think about the relationship between these four principal strata uh, and the observed uh, strata. So the observed strata is based on the encouragement, Z1 and Z0, and the treatment take up, T1, T equal 1, and T equal 0. Okay? Now think about the people who are encouraged and receive the treatment. So that's upper left corner cell. That's a mixture of compliers and always takers. Right? So these are the people who are encouraged and receive the treatment. So they are either compliers uh, or always takers. We don't know which because we don't know what they would have done if they weren't encouraged. Okay, they may have um, still taken the treatment, in which case they are always taker. If they wouldn't uh, take the treatment without encouragement, then they would be a complier. Now think about the upper right, right cell, uh, Z I equal 0, T I equal 1. So these are the people who are not encouraged and still took the treatment. Okay, so they are either defiers 
always take us. People who that depends on what would they have what they would have done if they are encouraged. So as you can see, in each of four observed cells, there are two different types of um, principal strata. And uh, so we know it's a mixture of the two different types, but we don't know uh, for any given individual whether that person is compiled or not. So what is the um, analysis we can do? So this is basically the classic instrumental variables uh, analysis, and it has the following assumptions. The first assumption is randomized encouragement, uh, which we're going to use as an instrument for the treatment. So instrument is a variable that uh, exogenously affects the endogenous treatment variable. Okay, so here we can use the randomized encouragement, since it's randomized, it's exogenous, as a, um, the variable that affects the treatment, which is the endogenous variable. The second assumption we're going to invoke is something called monotonicity. Um, in, in words, it means no defiers. So we assume there's nobody who would uh, do the exact opposite of what they're being told to do. So uh, formally, you can write out the, this as t of 1 is never uh, less than t of 0 for all i. Okay. So remember, t is bi uh, binary. So this excludes the possibility that t of 1 equals 0 and t of 0 equals 1. Okay. So the, no defiers. So we're going to assume that uh, there's no defiers. It's important to note that this assumption uh, is made for at the unit level. So this has to hold for every unit, not on average. The finally, and it's perhaps the most important assumption, is something called exclusion restriction. Okay. In words, it means that instrument, or in this case, the randomized encouragement, affects the outcome only through the treatment receipt. Okay. So in terms of potential outcomes, we can write as if uh, the T, the treatment is, status, is the same, then it doesn't matter whether you are encouraged or not. In other words, there is no direct effect of encouragement to the outcome other than through treatment itself. Okay. Um, another way of saying this is that there is a zero ITT effect for always takers and never takers. Because always takers and never takers uh, are not affected by the encouragement in terms of the treatment. Okay. Um, so they should have a zero ITT effect, right? The encouragement should not affect these people because the encouragement doesn't, by definition, encouragement don't affect their uh, treatment status. Okay. So that's basically the exclusion restriction. So the encouragement, uh, which is basically an instrument in this case, affects the outcome only through the treatment. So this would be problematic if um, encouragement doesn't change the take up, treatment take up, but um, changes the outcome, influences the outcome in some other ways. So, for example, suppose the encouragement here is the encouragement to do some uh, exercise or workout, and the treatment is actually whether you do exercise or workout. Okay. So, if the doctor tells the patient, oh, you should do exercise. You encourage the patients to do exercise, even if the patients are, say, never takers. So they would never do an exercise. Because they've been told to do the exercise, they may, say, change the diet to a healthy diet. Um, because they might think, oh, the doctor is telling me this because I'm not healthy, so I should change my diet. Right? So if the encouragement affects the uh, other behavior, and then that other behavior that influences the outcome, say, health outcome, then the exclusion restriction is violated. So this is a very important assumption that needs to be um, that needs to be um, satisfied in order for the instrumental variables analysis to work out. Okay. So basically, there is three assumptions that just to repeat. Uh, repeat. The instrument has to be random, right? Exogenous instrument, and here it's encouragement is randomized, so that's that's, that's satisfied automatically. We assume uh, the instrument affects in one direction, so there's assume that there's no defier, that nobody acts in opposition to the encouragement. 
And then uh, instrument only affects the outcomes only through the uh, treatment, so exclusion initiative. So there's no other mechanism that encouragement affects the outcome. So these three assumptions are going to be the um, set of assumptions that we're going to maintain for this instrument of variables and our research to work. Okay. Once we make this assumption, uh, we can do some analysis. Okay. The important thing here is to, uh, we're going to decompose the identity effect. So on the, on the left hand side, we have intention to treat effect, which is just we can identify this by difference in means, by comparing uh, a group of who are encouraged, an uh, average outcome of the group who are encouraged, and then subtract the average outcome of the control group, those who are not encouraged. And so the left hand side is just identifiable because the intention to treat itself is randomized. Now suppose we decompose this ITT effect into ITT effect for compliers, plus ITT effect for always takers, and plus ITT effect for never takers, and ITT effect for defiers. Okay, so ITT C, ITT A, ITT N, ITT D. Okay, so there are four types of people in the population. So overall ITT effect can be decomposed into those four types. And each of these ITT effects, sub, subgroup ITT effect, is multiplied by the proportion of each type. So pro proportion of compliers, proportion of always takers, and proportion of never takers, and proportion of defiers. Okay. Now, uh, by the virtue of monotonicity, we have no defier. So probability of uh, defiers, the last term, is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so the last term goes away. Now, by virtue of exclusion restriction, we assume that ITT effect is zero for always takers and never takers because the, we assume the instrument, the encouragement, only affects, affects the outcome only through the treatment. So these are the people who are not affected by the encouragement in terms of the treatment take up. So the, the ITT effect should be also zero. Okay, all that together the overall ITT effect under these assumptions is equal to the ITT effect for the compliers times the proportion of compliers. Okay. Now, I told you that the left-hand side, which is the overall ITT, is identified. So now the question is, what about the right-hand side? There are two terms, um, what, uh, proportion of compliers and ITT effect for compliers, subgroup ITT effect. Now we're going to focus on the proportion of compliers next. Okay. So under the monotonicity, now we have the same uh, table again. This is the relationship between observed strata and uh, principal strata. Okay. The, by the virtue of the monotonicity assumption, we assume there's no defier. Okay. That means that we can, uh, I can just uh, assume that there's no defiers in this table. What's nice about this is that in the off-diagonal cells, we there's only one type. For example, if z equal one and t equal zero, they are, we all know, we know that they are all never takers. And if z equal zero and t equal one, if someone is not encouraged but receive the treatment, then we know they are always takers because we assume that the fires don't exist. Okay, what? Well, uh, what this allows us to do is to identify a proportion of compliers. So how does that work? Well, it turns out the complier proportion equals the ITT effect of the encouragement on the treatment receipt. Okay, so here it's written as T of 1 minus T of 0, the average effect of encouragement on the ITT um, on the treatment receipt. This we can write it as, since T is binary, so the expectation is a probability, and by randomization, we can just estimate uh, T of 1 and T of, expectation of T of 1 and T of 0 separately from group that are encouraged and group who are not encouraged. Okay. And if you look at the among the people who are the first term, which is the among the What's the probability of t equal 1 among the, uh, those who are um, encouraged? Then they're basically compliers or always takers. Okay. And uh, among the people who are not encouraged and who take the treatment, which is the second term, 
they are always stateless. So if you subtract uh, the second term from the first term, you basically get the proportional compilers. Okay? So what this shows is that proportional compilers can be identified as the IPT effect of encouragement on the treatment receipt. Okay? By eliminating the defiers, we can identify proportion of always takers and never takers, and then we can subtract from the other cell to uh, estimate the proportional compilers. Now let's remember the equality that we left, uh, we derived earlier. So the, on the left hand side, we have overall ITT effect, which can be identified by the difference um, of average outcome between the encouraged and no encouraged, which is gonna be equal to ITT effect for compilers times the proportional compilers. And we just show that proportional compilers can be identified as well. Now, ITT for the compilers is actually the average treatment effect for the compilers. The reason is that encouragement is the same as the treatment status for compilers. Remember that the compilers are the people who comply with the treatment assignment, comply with the encouragement. So ITT effect um, for the compilers is the same as the average treatment effect for, for the compilers. Therefore, we can uh, write the IV estimate, that's the instrument of variable estimate. The estimate is the, is the quantity that we want to estimate is uh, equal to, so we want to, we, we can show that the instrument of variable estimates the ITT effect for compilers, which is, as I said, I, a average stream effect for compilers. By uh, rearranging the equality, we can show that that's equal to the ratio of overall ITT effect, which is in the uh, uh, numerator. And in the denominator, we have the proportional compilers. And as I discussed, the proportional compilers is um, identified as ITT effect of encouragement on the treatment take up. So we just have two difference in means. So difference in means uh, uh, in terms of outcome in the numerator, difference in means in terms of treatment take up in the denominator. And since Z is a binary, this actually is equal to the ratio of the two covariances. Uh, covariance between the outcome and encouragement, how strongly encouragement is correlated with the outcome. And then in the denominator, you have covariance between the encouragement and the treatment take up. So how strongly the treatment take up is related to the encouragement. Okay, so this is a classic instrument of variables estimator, which now we've shown that can be interpreted as average streaming effect for compilers. Okay, so this is called compiler average streaming effect uh, or Kate. Uh, another name for this is local average streaming effect uh, rate. So it's local because um, it's a treatment effect for the local population, not the entire population. And it's important to emphasize that the uh, Kate compiler average treatment effect is not necessarily equal to the overall average treatment effect unless um, average treatment effect for non compilers equals the compiler uh, average treatment effect. Okay, so remember the non compilers were, um, you know, always taker and never taker. Uh, where the defiers are um, assumed to be not exist here. Okay, so unless the average stream in fact is the same for both between the compilers and non compilers, um, we cannot say that this instrument of variables estimate um, um, can be generalized to the whole population. In, in other words, the only part of the population the instrument of variables applies to uh, is the compilers, the ones who actually comply with the encouragement. This means that different encouragement, uh, different instruments, yields different compilers, hence may yield different average stream effect uh, for the compilers. Okay, so it's important to know that just because um, you have the same treatment variable, um, you you not necessarily get the same effects if you have different instruments. Um, it's being used to estimate the uh, cohort effects.